Aloha mai. Hello everyone. This is going to be a talk about old time Hawaiian stonework, <clears throat> what stones were used and why, and how it was done. <clears throat> I'm going to say a few words in Hawaiian for some of you who know that language. Certainly in Hawaii a lot of people do now. Ovao no o kaimi loa aupuni kahula chrisman. Noho ao i keawa i ka mainland. Moku o Yavapai, o Cottonwood ke Kauna, um, Maikai ke Kauna, um, he aloha ka poi e loko. Uh, Kalamai hoi i <laughs> ko'u olelo ana i ka leo kanaka um, hiki au ke olelo i ka olelo Hawaii lili vale no. Um, I said um, I live now in Arizona. Um, on the mainland in, uh, in the town of Cottonwood, and the people here are very nice and aloha. Uh, my wife and I, Namaka uh, lived in Hawaii for many, many years and had to come here because the log from the volcano was just really ruining my health. So we brought everything Hawaiian with us, and we've been teaching and, and uh, doing cultural things for the last 19 years here in Arizona. So today we're going to talk about all these pohaku. Pohaku is the Hawaiian word for stones. And how did I learn about this kind of work? I had no teacher. There was no one alive uh, back in the 70s when I first started doing this to teach me. And so I just had to read whatever I could, look at all the stones, which I'm good at doing. I'm good at seeing what's there. And I knew something about Native Hawaiian, or excuse me, Native American work with stones and other places in the world because it was essentially the same everywhere. But the difference in Hawaii is they only had a certain kind of stone and that was volcanic stone, basaltic stone. And they didn't have the granite or the jade or the many other kinds of stone that were available to people around the world. They simply didn't have that. So they had what's called cellular basalt, which is like these pieces over here that have many pores they may have great big pores from lots of gas that was in the lava as it erupted, or very, very fine pores like some of these other ones where the lava cooled with very little gas in it, or very, very solid stones over here, like the solid basalt, some of which gets to be very, very fine and black and utterly poreless. So they had to learn what to do with those things and how to do it, and what they worked with were hammer stones. We're going to talk about the different hammer stones here. We're going to talk about the hard basalt and how it's flaked to make certain implements or even cutting tools from the chips. And we're going to talk about the softer stones that were used to make all kinds of things and how to recognize what you might be able to work and what you want to avoid. So all that I had to learn over the last 40 or 45 years by trial and error. So I've spent hundreds of hours doing this. I'm ridiculously patient and maybe that was a gift and <laughs> maybe it was a detriment but I've spent an awful lot of time on this and a little later we're going to go inside and look at a lot of the finished products and talk about those but in any case um, we're going to start in with what we would do if if I took you to a riverbed somewhere or to a, an ocean beach that had a lot of stones and how would we pick out the stones it's really difficult to do this in a video because if you're not right with me and I can't point things out to you, you know, one after another, as students might come to me in a place like that and say, what about this one, Kumu teacher? What about this one? Well, no, that's not a good one because, or yo, that's a great one because. So that can happen dozens of times if we were on an excursion somewhere for three or four hours and we were looking at thousands and thousands of stones. But the key is you want to try to find the stone that's the closest in form to what you want to make. Because if it takes you three hours to find that stone, and it saves you six hours of pecking and grinding, it's worth the three hours now, isn't it? So that's the key thing, of trying to find something as close to the shape and form of what you want to make as possible. And it has to also be without flaws and capable of being worked into what you want to make. Not too hard, not too soft. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. So let's start in with some of these stones as if we were at a place like that. Say 
there was a river that came down to the ocean through lots of stones over thousands of years into the ocean. The ocean rolls those stones all around, the storms toss them back and forth, and then sometimes they're thrown up onto the beach. So you can look at thousands of stones in one place like that. But if we were looking at those and say we wanted to make a shallow bowl or a deeper bowl or a lamp, uh, a poi pounder, that was a tool to, to make uh, the staple food in Hawaii called poi, or a weapon, or an adze, which is a chopping tool, or a sling stone, uh, a ball, any of these things, we'd have to try to find a stone that approached that shape, shape and, and form as much as possible and didn't have flaws and was a good stone to work. So we're going to go through some of these stones that I've brought from Hawaii or I found here. So let's say we wanted to make a ball. That's a, that's a pretty good task, but we'll see a couple of good ones inside later. Here's one. Is that a good choice to make a ball? Well, it's got a ball in there. It wouldn't be too big a one, but it has lots of flaws. See these big holes? Pukas, we call them in Hawaii. It's a real, real cellular basalt, but the edges of the holes are real crisp. That means the stone is very, very hard. It's going to be hard to work. Then it's also going to be brittle and chip out around the holes. So no, that is not a good stone for a ball. But what about this one? I actually found that one here in Arizona. It's real, real heavy, which means it's real, real hard. And again, the edges of the little holes are very sharp edged. So it's hard, but it doesn't have much in the way of flaws, and it actually is fairly close to being a ball. And that's a one in a million, literally about one in a million stones you're going to find it's pretty close to being a ball, and you can make something out of that. So how about this stone? Let's look at this. Say we wanted to make a small platter. Now I pick it up, it's really heavy for its size. That means it's going to be really hard. It's really, really dense. If we look underneath, oh, it's pretty good for a little slightly rounded bowl on the bottom. Top isn't too bad, except it's got this high place right here. Got a little nick there, a few other little dinks and things. So, yeah, we could make a shallow bowl out of that, but it'd be really hard to do because it's such a hard stone. And the first clue is when you pick it up, it's so heavy. How about this one? This one came from here. Could we make a little platter out of that one? Yeah, we sure could. Look at the shape. That's a natural form. The chance of finding that, 1 in 40,000 probably. It's got a few little bigger holes right here and right here where it's going to chip out when you work on that. But hopefully we'd get through those and get into some more even stone. And on the bottom, it's very even. This is just dirt here. Very even. It's got a little dink right there, but that'll knock right off with pecking. The top is just begging to have a hollow put right here. It's already in a good oval shape. Awesome, good find. It's pretty hard, pretty heavy, so it's going to take a while to work. This one could make a real shallow bowl, or more likely something like these platters over here. And that's what I would make, some kind of platter out of this. It's pretty even in its grain. Here we've got one little flaw right here, another flaw over here. Pretty good shape all in all. It wouldn't take too much time to make this into a pretty nice oval. But make a little hollow here if you wanted to without too much trouble by pecking it with a hammer stone. But it's real hard. It's heavy and it's real hard. It's going to be slow to work. What about this one? So this has got something in there maybe. We could make a slightly ovoid bigger bowl. It's got a nick out of it here where some boulder hit it in a stream bed probably during a flood. It's got a hard place right there. See how it doesn't have any pores right there? That's going to be very hard to peck that area right there. It's going to be really hard, and it's a flat place. You'd have to work all around that to get that out. This side looks good. It's got a good even surface. Again, heavy. So it's going to be a hard stone and hard to work. How about this one? It's got some color. It's going to have more color if it's wetted or it's oiled. It has a flaw right there. See that? There's some kind of crack right there. And when you're working it, it might crack further. It may have a bigger flaw inside. It's got some holes right here, bigger gas holes from when the lava formed. So when that's chipped away there, there might be more underneath, or you may get rid of that. It might be fine. We've got a big knob here that would come off, a defect right here. 
and its all in all shape is very irregular. It's pretty heavy, so that means it's medium hard. It has a little color which is interesting, but not really a very good stone because too much work to make it into something. How about this one? Not too heavy. Not too heavy. Has a flaw right there, a big hole. No cracks. A little bit of difference in color right here versus here and a little line right here. There's something different between those two bits of lava, but they're very similar. Over here, we can see that difference too. But pretty much, pretty good, right? Pretty good as far as making a deeper bowl. Not, not bad, except for one little thing. See that bump right there? No, poo, no little pukas, little holes. That's a hard spot. There's, big, there's a hard spot right there. And we don't really know what would happen working that. Probably it'll come away, but it may just go right down into the stone and be hard to work. But that's, that's not too bad. How about this? What if we wanted to make a real shallow little platter like we'll see inside later for a particular purpose? Pretty good. It's got some deep holes here. They're real clean edged. So it's a real hard stone. It's more the kind of stone that might be used for some kind of polishing or grinding. A real shallow dish, but we'd have to get rid of these holes like this. And it's hard. It's pretty hard. So I'd say no. Probably not our purposes. How about that one? Okay, how about a shallow dish out of that one? It's flat up here. The pores are pretty even. Got a little drop off right here. A little hole right here. High spot here. See this whole side here? So that would need to be taken down. But all in all, it looks tolerably good. It's fairly heavy, so it's going to be fairly hard. But for a small, shallow bowl, it's already shaped. Not too bad. I wouldn't say ideal. Not too bad. What about that one? It's got a little reddish color. You could make maybe a small ball or some other object like a squid lure weight out of something. But look at the flaws in here. Here, 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 here. Here's a crack right here. There's another crack right here. So yes, it's got some bulk, but it's got these big flaws in it here and there. You don't know what you're going to find as you work it. So it's medium heavy, so not too hard, but I wouldn't work it. There's too many problems with that stone. It's not going to be a good stone to work. So then how about we look at a couple of other things. What if we found this one, for instance? It's really rough if you rub it with your hand. It's already shaped to your hand, a little bit flatted right here. It may have actually been a rubbing stone from the past to rub on wood and shape wood, final polishing kind of stuff. But it's also evenly porous. See how even the pores are all over? It's evenly porous all over, not very heavy. It's going to be fairly soft, pretty easy to work. You can make whatever you want out of that. Just a nice little bowl like a lamp. You make it easily out of that stone right there. Here's another one. See how the holes are a little bit bigger? But it's even. See the holes all around? They're even. It's a little heavier, but it's got fairly good roundness. It's very, very rare to find a stone that's round in cross-section. They'll almost always be ovoid, like this is. But this could make a great big squid lure weight. It could make a club head. It could make a small little bowl you hold in your hand. But look at the difference in the form. See the evenness here? All the little holes? Now look right here. There's a hard spot right there. Hard lava right there with bigger holes in it. So that's going to be a problem. When you work it, this whole vein of hardness right here is going to be different than all the rest, and it's going to thwart you in what you're trying to do. If you can get it knocked away, then all the rest of this is a great stone. But you've got to look at everything. And then lastly, how about this one? This stone came from Hawaii. It's already got a nice form. It's even in thickness. It's even all over in the amount of porosity, very fine pores, medium weight. It's a gray kind of stone, and many of the poi pounders and things are made out of this gray kind of stone. I don't really know exactly where it comes from, but I found this, no doubt, on some beach, a stone beach in Hawaii. 
and that'll make a ring type pounder like from the island of Kauai. It's a, a mashing tool, a pounder, but you it has a ring, a hole through it in the middle where you grasp it like this. I think probably women use those. It's perfect for making that. And finding a stone like that again is one in 20,000, but that's what you want for making a poi pounder, anything else, even grained all the way around, already very much like the shape you want to make and not too heavy. So yeah, it'll take a while to make something, but I could make a ring pounder probably in about 10 hours of work with that. Now we're going to turn our attention to some other things. First of all, the hammer stones. How do you work those stones? You've got to have what we call hammer stones. So we can have a stone like that. You can sure hammer with that. You could break other stones with that, but it's just too big and heavy to use for any kind of pecking on these stones to shape them. So this is more the kind of hammer stone you'd use to split the hard basalt. How about this one? Well, that looks like a pretty good hammer stone. It's about two-thirds the weight of that one. If it's pretty good in my hand, I've got a big hand. Yeah, I could strike some pretty good blows with that, but I can't peck with this. It's too heavy. I can strike real heavy blows if I was trying to shape a blank just very quickly and knock off big pieces all at once. Yeah, I could use that, but not for the kind of pecking you do to shape this like you're going to see all the tools inside. So how about these? There's a pretty good hammer stone. It's got a lot of little bumps on the end of it. If you find one out in the wild somewhere and it's got a whole lot of little nicks and bumps on one or both ends, it was somebody's hammer stone maybe several thousand years ago. So that's pretty good. If I let this float in my hand like this as I'm pecking something, yeah, pretty good. With my strength in my hand, I could handle that stone pretty good. And it's pretty smooth here. It's not going to rub my fingers too much. Maybe a little too big. What about if I needed to do some fine work, like around the neck of a poi pounder or some weapon or something? Then I need some smaller hammer stones like these. They need to be the real, real, real dense, smooth kind of basalt. Something that I can get in a small area and peck without very much of a blow thousands of times to work a smaller area. Or say we wanted to make the outline of the eye on a stone image or something like that. Then we would use these specialized kinds of pecking stones or hammer stones. Here's a couple of them that I've used a lot. They're just real hard stones, pretty even. And they're not bowling stones or anything. See all the little irregular knocks on here? That's from me using this like this. See how fast I'm going? about three strikes a second. So that's what I need, something in my hand that'll just float in my fingers. I don't want to hold it tight. First one I ever made, to something I've ever made, I held the hammer stone tight because we're used to holding tools like that all our lives. When you hold it tight, it beats your joint to death right there. You mustn't hold it tight. And you want the stone to hit another stone and bounce back. Every time I let go, I'm not holding it tight. So it flies into the other stone with all its strength. And it bounces back into my hand. So it bounces up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, as I just barely hold it enough to keep control. That's how you use a hammer stone. And here's another one the same way, a small one. So what about these? These are the one in a million stones too. See how they're nearly round? Very unusual to find stones that are nearly round in cross section. They're perfectly smooth. They're very, very hard. Ala, that's the name for the hard basalt in Hawaii. And they're great. You know, they're just about the right weight to work. Even somebody with a lot less strength than me can hold this, but it's really slick. It's hard to hold. It wants to jump out of your hands. But yeah, you can, you can really get a hold of it and hit just holding it very loosely, very rapidly with that and ditto with this. If we wanted to make a superb sling stone, you could make it out of either one of these, but it'd take you hours and hours and hours because it's so hard. So better to use these two as hammer stones. What about that one? See that one? Almost round, one in a million. You almost never find stones like that. That's a good sling stone just as it is. It has a big flaw right here. 
but nonetheless it could be shaped into a football shaped swing stone like the Hawaiians and other Polynesians used. It's not too hard, not near as hard as these little flaw right here. You could work it down, it would be a real good sling stone as is, as I say, but you could work it down, like we'll see inside later, into an actual sling stone. So getting over here to the basalt. The solid basalt sometimes will form pieces like this. Pieces will break off the cliff or natural fall or water will get in there and freeze way up high in the mountains and split off pieces, but this is basalt that can be chipped and people all around the world learn how to chip it <coughs> similar to flint into the tools that they needed to make. Sometimes a boulder will fall off a cliff way up high and drop down and hit another basalt boulder that's real high quality stuff and throw off a huge flake like that. That's sharp all the way around there just by nature. And over here I chipped it a little bit to make it sharp on this side too. So that's an incredible natural tool or scraping tool that nature provided. So how would you change one of these pieces into something like this? All you need to do is to find some kind of hard basalt that's pre-shaped a little like that. And this, this is very junk stuff compared to this. But something you can strike on, and I'm, I'm not good at that, and I don't think anybody alive today is good at chipping that basalt. Not by a handheld hammerstone. Maybe by using some kind of brass tool or a steel tool and some kind of mallet to strike it. Yeah, you could shape the stone that way. But the miraculous work that was done in the old times in Hawaii and elsewhere took years and years and years of skilled practice. So this probably took me with a hammer stone and a suitable flake maybe 10 minutes to do all this flaking along here and make this into a very suitable hoe or digging tool or even cutting tool. These here, if I get a good hard piece like that, a hammer stone like that, better have one more like this, I could hit a little faster. I can go whack, 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 and make that hand adds that I could cut with, you know, I could cut into wood, actually cut through a small tree with that if I had to in five seconds. But that's just random flaking real fast. Same thing with this one, if I take this, Stone and it's already got some places I can hit on. We can hit it down at about a 30 degree angle, like that. See that? And the chips that fly off are really, really sharp. Instant cutting tools. They don't last too long, but they make great cutting tools. So by doing that in a highly skilled way, I could shape this stone into something I could then grind down into an adz or other tool. And that's exactly what they did. This one would be really easy to chip all the way around the edge and then grind it and have a handheld knife or some similar cutter. So let's turn our attention over here to if you pecked it, a stone down to a certain form and you wanted to grind it out on the surface or you made an adze and you wanted to grind the blade, how would you do that? So I had to learn that for myself. And one of the things that I learned was some of the big grinding stones that the Hawaiians used are just filled with little crystals. And sometimes you'll find stones like that in the sun. You can see the little crystals gleaming in the stone. And I wonder if those crystals are hard enough to cut this basalt. Yeah, they are. They are. So if you can get a stone like this that's filled with those little crystals in Hawaii or anywhere else, and you peck out a shape, you can then grind it with that by hand. And I also learned how to do this, just make my own grinding stones by taking one of these stones like this that has fine pores and pecking it till it had a flat surface. And then it's got a lot of little pores, and right? It's filled up right now from grinding. It's, the pores are all filled up. But then you take this. This is olivine sand. It's green sand, they call it in Hawaii. In Hawaii, if you said green sand beach, people would know. A black sand beach is different, but green sand is olivine. It's a gemstone that's fairly soft. And so some of the lava, especially in the Kona coast of the Big Island, is loaded with olivine. So over centuries, those stones get into the ocean. They get broken up, and then sand is formed. So you've got the lighter or blacker sand from coral or broken up basalt, and you've got green sand from the olivine. And the green sand is a little lighter. 
than the other dark sand or the, or the uh, shell sand. And when the waves wash up on the shore, there'll be little ridges of olivine sand left on the top. It's somehow lighter and it'll be right on the top where the waves recede and you can go out and scoop off that green sand and use it. So by putting some water on here and sprinkling on the olivine sand and then grinding like this, this is a piece of hard basalt and I flake the edge of it and now I'm just grinding it into an edge. So if I grind it on a regular stone, I get nowhere. I could polish it, but I can't really grind it very well. But with the help of the olivine sand or either one of these, and I've used those for demonstrations, um, and you could have multiple ones of those for various students if you wanted to. But that's a way to have a portable grindstone, or you've got a portable grindstone in that. When we get inside, we'll see some more of that stuff. Here's a couple of things in progress. This is an ulamica. That's a bowling stone, very well known from Hawaii. Pretty much a unique game there as far as I know. So it's a round stone with convex sides, so it's got more mass centrally and doesn't tend to fall over as you roll it. Flat on the sides and it has to be round. So how do you make it round? What I learned was get inside of a doorway. If you had an old time grass house or today's house or shed or anything, get inside of a doorway where you're in the shade and you're looking out toward the bright sky. So when you're in that shade and looking up toward the bright sky, this will appear perfectly dark. And you can turn this around against the bright sky. And your eye will see the slightest out around. If there's a little bump somewhere, you just keep pecking that spot and working around, pecking and pecking to get it as round as possible. And then you do the same thing on the outsides, make it convex. And of course, you have to pick a stone that's capable of doing that. And if you get little pukas, these little holes along the edge, you have to be really careful not to strike that way or you'll chip off these edges. You have to strike in this way when you're near an edge. But that's pretty close to being an ulamica already. And that's just something I did at demonstrations. Probably took me about four hours. This is the last one I'll mention. This little stone I found and it had a deep, deep hole in here and a pretty deep hole right here. So right away to our minds, it's eyes. So if I pecked this hole deeper with one of these real pointy hammer stones, and then I made a little face here, a little bit of a nose, some brow ridges here, a little crest like a helmet. So that was just a, an image, what we call a ki'i, just kind of for fun at one of the demonstrations I was doing. But that's using a found stone that has defects to your advantage. And when we go inside, we're gonna see some more things like an anchor using stone defects to your advantage. So we've covered a lot out here, and now we're gonna go inside and see a lot more different stones and what they were made into and talk more about this whole process. Aloha. Aloha mai. Hello everyone. We're inside now looking at a lot of Hawaiian, what looks like artifacts, but every one of those are things that I've made stone on stone. No modern tools, no metal, no hammers. Stone on stone only. And I tried, as experimental archaeology, to keep the time of how long it took to make each thing. So as I mentioned, you work a little bit at a time. You Work on the stone a little bit, set it down somewhere maybe by the door where you'll see it all the time. And the next time you feel like working on it, you pick it up and work on it some more. And it will get finished that way. If you try to do it eight hours a day, you'll drive yourself crazy. Your hand will get too sore, your arm will get too tired. So you do a little at a time, exactly the way the Hawaiians would have done in ancient times. So we talked outside about the different kinds of stone and selecting the best grade and the best shape of stone to make what you want to make. So I pretty well know how long it took me to make each of these things. Before I left Hawaii, after 31 years there, I had spent, on my recording time anyway, about 102 hours doing many of these things. So about two and a half full work weeks. But that was a little bit at a time, a little here, a little bit there. And since coming here to Arizona, I've spent another, oh, 
58 or so hours making other things at demonstration events and on my own and so on. So somewhere around two or four full 40-hour work weeks if you added it all up. But to me, it was pleasure. It's kind of like meditation when you're pecking on a rock. You're just working, 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 working. Your hand is almost like a little machine and you have plenty of time to think. You can get deep into what you're doing. You can think about all kinds of things. You can feel the stone and so on. Now, why do I say feel the stone? In Hawaiian thinking, things are animate. Stones and everything else have some kind of spirit to it, just like a Native American thought. In Western thought, these are dead objects. But to someone who works with stones all the time, picks up hundreds of different stones, if you feel it, if you close your eyes and just relax, you can tell the difference between one stone and another. Some stones just feel dead, and some stones feel a little bit alive, and some of them feel really alive. That sounds really strange from a Western education, a Western thinking type of mindset. But there's more to this world than we think. And as I grew up in a Western world with Western education, um, becoming a doctor and so on, you just hear rigid, lineal thought patterns. But in Hawaiian thinking, Hawaiian thought, Hawaiian practices, it's a very different ballgame. So let's get into these objects here, how long it took to make them, uh, how I made them, and so on. Outside we talked about the different stones, the hammer stones. Um, here is probably the most iconic object from Hawaii, the poi pounder. The poi pounder probably would have had a little bit of tapa glued around here to, to make it easier on your hand. Tapa is bark cloth. But it's rounded on the bottom, and it's used on a, on a wooden platter, slightly hollowed wooden, to pound and smooth the poi, the staple, staple starch of Hawaii. So that was made from a very evenly grained type of basalt, as you can see. Pretty hard, pretty hard basalt. And the, and the hardness of poi pounders, this would be about three quarters of the way up the scale. So that took me 21 hours total, about 20 and a half hours to make it and another half or three quarters of an hour to polish it. And I was using one of those stones I talked about that's got the crystals in it to polish this. So how did I make that? First I found a stone that looked as much like a poi pounder as possible that had even grain, didn't seem to have any flaws. I had a hammer stone, that one right there. Fit my hand real good. Got a little curve that fits my hand real good. I can go real fast with that hammer stone. It doesn't come out of my hand. Three pecks a second. I need a real, real hard hammer stone, pointy, narrow tipped like this, to go up into this part and peck very carefully. And you really got to support it here firmly on your leg or on something as you peck and be very careful because a good sharp blow right there when it's rounded will snap it right off. Trust me, I know. So that's what I did the neck part with, that hammer stone. And then I pecked it lightly all over to get it as flat as I could. And then I used this stone, you can see where it's been rubbed, that has a lot of crystals in it, to polish it. So those three stones made that poi pounder in about 21 hours total. So the shortest thing would be this little bowling stone like this. That's called an ulamica. It was just rolled in a game. That small one only took me 35 minutes. Just found a pretty round stone, pretty even texture. It didn't take very long at all. The first one I ever made, I think that's the first stone thing I ever made, was that ulamica. You can see the convex side. The smaller it is, the more convex it's got to be to have stability, central mass, so when it rolls it doesn't fall over. But it's really pretty darn round and pretty well polished and really hard with salt. That took me about six hours to make and polish. One like this, Ulamica, bigger one, pretty soft lava, about two and a half hours. And this one, smaller, easier to make, pretty soft lava, once again, about two hours. This, see this little disc here? perfectly flat on both sides. 
rounded on the edges. It's not an ulamica, it's called a kilu. It was a stone that you would toss across a mat in a game that the ali'i, the, the aristocratic people would play back and forth on a mat and they had other kilos, but this one is like a Hawaiian mirror, which would be three and a half or four and a half inches in diameter, but exactly like that, which could be oiled, put into a shallow dish of water, and it would serve as a mirror. So that would be just like making a mirror. That only took me about two hours because I found a real good stone to start with. Um, but to make a mirror, I would estimate, I've never done it, probably take me um, 10 hours something like that, 10 hours. Now how about some of these other things? Um, here is a game ball, really, really hard basalt. Uh, that is really hard, but I just happened to find a stone that was almost round, and so in two and three quarters hours, I had it pecked out, and in another hour and a quarter, I had it polished. It's not perfectly round. I could make it perfectly round if I worked longer, but that only took me about four hours and that's for another type of rolling game. How about this one? That's a real good ball. Sometimes the Hawaiians had balls this big that they could get up on with their feet. The warriors would strengthen their feet and their legs by rolling the ball around or by using it like a weight for, weight per for strength purposes. But see how it's got a pretty even grain all the way around, a little finer on this side than the grain on this side but it really is pretty darn round, and it's because out of thousands and thousands and thousands of stones, I found one that was pretty round and pretty even textured. This is the same kind of gray stone that poi pounders are often made out of. But that only took me about seven hours, I think it was. About seven hours to peck it out round and then polish it. So how about this one? This is just what we call in Hawaii a ki'i, an image. And the fishermen would have images like this sometimes on their little shrines where they'd make offerings for their fishing luck or safety. And it just represents a fish. So sometimes you see a stone and in your mind you can see what's in that stone. And what was in this stone was a little fish image to me. So with one of those sharply pointed um, pecking stones like this, I simply worked on this fairly hard but very porous lava and made this fish image. It's got a fin and it's got its gill here and it's got its eye and a little tail. And that was only about an hour and a half at some cultural festival I made that. How about this one? This is a club head. That's called a neva. Four-sided so that it hides the wrappings very, very well and has four crushing sides on it. And so that was one of the weapons that Hawaiians used. It's fairly soft lava, fairly porous. And because I can beat real fast on these grooves and don't have to worry about breaking things, I could really go after that stone. And that only took me about four hours to make. It's not polished. But here's another neva. This head here is really, really hard basalt. The real, real hard black basalt. So that one took me 27 and a half hours to peck with that hammer stone right there. That's an even harder basalt that's hard enough that it will stand up to pecking on this one over and over and over and over. And it's rounded on the edges from doing that pecking over and over and over flattened on the end from the very light pecking that I did toward the end to flatten it out as much as possible on the four faces. And then I had about another three and a half hours using a stone like that with the crystals in it to polish the four faces fairly well. If I polished them more, I could get them down to pure black. Beautiful. And the total of that was 31 hours. That's the longest thing of anything I ever made stone on stone. How about some of these other things? Um, this little bowl we're going to talk about more later. What in the world is a nice little bowl that's as shallow as that for? Well, we're going to find out shortly. We'll talk about that. I flatted it just because I use it in demonstrations in modern times where it's on a table, but it's been a natural stone that I've finished all over and then polished it down. It has just a shallow little dish. So we'll get back to that. This one is a nice little bowl or lamp. 
Again, I flatted it a little bit on the bottom, but it's fully shaped all the way around. Its form is shaped round. It has a nice even hollow in it. That was about four and a half hours to finish it completely, bottom and top and the hollow, about four and a half hours. So that would be something like a lamp um, or a pestle, a mortar. Um, and here's another little mortar. This one is real hard basalt. See how it's barely porous at all, real hard, but it, it just had a natural form like a bowl. And so taking this part out, this would be real good for an oil lamp or uh, what we call kukui nuts in Hawaii. They're a very, very oily kind of nut that is baked and then put on a, a little stick so that you can burn it like a candle. Um, but this took about two hours because really all I had to do was knock out this central hole here, even though it's real, real hard stone, about, about two hours. And these two here, here's a real nice gray one. And I just happened to find a real good even, even stone, you know, real even porosity. It was fairly close to the shape I wanted. It's completely shaped all over and the hollow. And that was about seven hours. And this one is what we call ula ula in Hawaii, kind of a reddish brown color, especially if it was wetted or oiled, it would look more reddish. But it's been also fully done, bottom, sides, everywhere, fully pecked, and a nice hollow in it. And that was about seven and a half hours, maybe about seven, about seven hours. And this is the hard basalt pestle, real, real hard basalt. Again, when you're making that neck, you have to be awful careful and support it when you're pecking it or it'll just snap right off. But this would be a medicinal type pestle, but a real hard one. You could crush up anything you wanted with that. And the pestle actually took me seven and a half hours. It took me a little longer to make than the bowl itself did. How about that? An odd curved stone. I saw one like that one time in an old time canoe shed, just sitting on the rocks in the canoe shed. So what is that? That's a canoe polisher. So when the canoe hull was first made, chipping it out with an adze, that's a tool we're going to talk about shortly, um, they would have to polish down the surface, smooth it out, and or if it got barnacles and things on it later from long use or sitting in some spot. Um, they'd polish it off with a rough canoe polisher like that. And that took about an hour and a half to make. Um, there are some other things like this in basalt. And this is something we talked about before, using some natural feature of the stone to your advantage. So here was a stone, the Hawaiians needed stones like this, say a great big shark net needed heavy weights to hold it down. Uh, or if you had a, a small lightweight canoe and just wanted to hold it in place for without much wind to blow the canoe, you could use this anchor. There were much bigger anchors, of course. But this stone had a flaw. It had a big, deep flaw right here. And by pecking and pecking and pecking and pecking on that side around the flaw, and then packing, pecking over here, I got a hole through it. And so that, then it then becomes a great big net wake or an anchor. This is coral, the white coral that's on some beaches, and some of that coral is really pretty soft. So I did that just as a demonstration one time, probably at some cultural event, and that took me about four and a half hours to make the pestle and the full bowl. So it's not very good. I mean, you wouldn't want to grind up things that you're going to use for foodstuffs or medicines in here because you'd get too much of the coral dust. I don't think the coral dust would hurt you, but for doing simple tasks and, and meshing or grinding up simple things, that's a quick way to work. And the same thing over here. This is an ulamica. And if somebody was going to start out with stonework, that might be a good way just to start because you don't have to have so much patience. I just went to the beach where there was a lot of coral washed up and found a piece that looked pretty solid and began pecking on it. So mostly this is the natural surface. And maybe this is pretty much natural, and I have just pecked out the basic ulamica probably in no more than an hour or so to make that. 
Now, it's not going to hold up very well, and you can't bowl it against another stone and expect it to do too good in that kind of competition. But it is one way to start working on stone is to use something like that. These things are hard coral. This is a pestle that probably took me about an hour and a half to shape. I used the natural form and then reworked it into a good pestle. It's very ergonomic, fits real good. So this would hold up a long time. This hard coral is really tough stuff. And because it was naturally shaped to begin with, it only took me about an hour and a half to make that pestle. This one is kind of fun because I saw this stone and somehow it just kind of called to me that I'd try to make one of these pestles with a face. In the Marquesas Islands and sometimes elsewhere in Polynesia, you're more likely to see objects that have a face, but it's got little ridges around the eyes, a perfect eye, a nose, a little chin down here. Uh, it's a pretty functional tool and pretty darn hard, and it only took me about an hour and a half, but that meant I had to have really a very small pointy uh, thing to peck this part out with and be very careful about it. So there's a couple other things over here. Um, these are called the weights for a luhe'e. A luhe'e we're going to talk about in a minute. That's a, a squid lure weight. And in Hawaii, the octopus is termed a squid in English for some reason. But these odd kidney bean shaped stones that have a groove across the top and a groove across the bottom, and sometimes are even shaped a little bit here and here, are made to fit a cowrie shell. So that's a small cowrie shell. Some of them are great big like this. But the cowrie is a favorite food of the octopus. They can grab this shell, get their tentacles inside the cleft on the underside, and literally pull the shell apart and get the meat that's inside. So one of these cowrie shells was fitted to the, the weight, and that held it evenly in the water when this was let down in the water near where there might be octopuses living in holes in the bottom or amongst the rocks. And that would lure the octopus to come out and grab the cowrie. And the Hawaiian would then jerk this and hook the, the uh, octopus with the, the point. So this one is a little less than fully traditional because for a talk in Samoa, I had to make one of these things real quick to show the, the people I was talking to about you know, survival techniques and early Polynesian techniques. So I went to the beach with nothing. And I came back eight hours later with this. So I, made, I had to find this stone, find a hammer stone to peck it, make the groove here, make the groove there, shape the rest of it. I had to find some kind of stone that would be like a cutter to cut the soft wood like this and make a little groove in it here and there for the lashing. I had to find a piece of bone, rub it with a, a braid or stone to shape it into a point, find some other little piece of, of uh, broken uh, basalt that I could use like a hand drill to make a hole. I found a little piece of shell here that I could use to attach the cord to on this end because that's the way you lash these things. And then I had to make some cordage out of some banana leaf that I found along the edge of the beach. And so in eight hours, I went to the beach with nothing, and I came back with that. So that's a pretty good facsimile of a, a luhe. A, a proper one would have a bigger hook on it and a, a little bit more refined. But that's that particular thing that was used in old-time culture. Now what about these things? These are basalt chisels and a coral chisel and some splitters. So what's a splitter? A splitter is kind of like a chisel, but it's got a lot thicker cross section. It doesn't break easily. So if you've got wood that will crack in a linear fashion towards its center core, you can put these things into the crack and beat on them and gradually break out pieces of that core to make a spear or other stick of any kind in a tool. So find a real good piece of real hard basalt, real, real hard black smooth basalt, and grind it. And that took me about an hour and a half. And this one is a really, really good chisel made of just the best, most perfect basalt, absolutely poreless. This takes a perfect black polish. If you oil it, it would be just shiny, shiny black. And that one was about two hours. And this is the kind of chisel you would hit with a mallet to shape something or possibly fit it into a handle and then hit on the handle to shape something. 
This is another chisel that was naturally formed and all I did was grind the ends here about a, about an hour to do the blade there. These blades are really pretty sharp. They're almost as sharp as a steel blade, but they won't hold their edge very long. You have to resharpen them a little bit every five minutes or so. Sometimes you can find some really, really hard coral like this, and I've shaped it so that it could be worn as an ornament, and it's also a chisel or a splitter. And then this one is another piece of hard coral, and I've simply shaped it into a blade on both sides. So again, this is just something that could be used as a splitter from simple materials that would be at the beach. And lastly, this big one here was a natural piece of basalt that had been broken, you know, by boulders falling off a cliff or something, but I probably chipped it a little bit and then I polished it here, here and here, to make a blade. So that took me six hours of slow polishing because it's such hard stone. But this is the kind of thing you could use like a draw knife if you're making a spear or something, a handle for something else, to scrape along it after you have used what's called an adze to, to do the basic shaping. So that's another type of tool made from basalt um, by chipping and especially by grinding. Now we're going to go up here and look at this little bowl that we talked about. The Hawaiians had a thing called ohe kapala kapa. And that was a tool made out of a piece of split bamboo in which this part was pretty flexible and this part was rigid. And on that part, they would carve a design so that when you stamp this on something and repeatedly stamped it over and over and over on a sheet of bark cloth, it would make a continuous design, just like a tire does when it runs through the mud. So they had to carve those things with something, and that something was a shark's tooth knife, which is a very effective tool if you use it carefully. And I have carved these things with shark's tooth knives. So that was an art, that printing art, that was in existence before any foreigners came to Hawaii. So they had invented that printing before anybody came, and no one else in, amongst the Polynesians does that that I know of. That was, that was some one of the many unique things that Hawaiians invented. So you needed a little dish like this. So when you put the, you take the dish, then put some gum, like from breadfruit tree or kukui, fill up all the little pores with gum so it would perfectly hold water, so that's the dye. And you'd have this sitting here and your, your tapa is laid out somewhere that you're gonna be able to stamp it. And you'd put the, the stamp into the dye like this, flick it a time or two to get off most of the excess dye, and then carefully press it onto the tapa, wiggle it a little bit back and forth, lift it up, and you've got a perfect print. Then you'd repeat this, put this on very carefully right next to the previous print, rock it a little bit, lift it up, and again, on and on and on. So you can make incredible patterns, you can put other lines or colors through that, and they made beautiful, beautiful tapas in that way. So these things are sling stones. So these sling stones are shaped just like what I call a pregnant football. They're perfectly aerodynamic. So what are, why did they go to all the trouble to make a stone like this? Each one of these took me about an hour to an hour and a half to peck out, and in this case, grind, or I ground this one a little bit too. So. When a quarterback throws the football, what do they do? Their hand spins the football as it goes. And so it'll fly perfectly true right where he wants it to go. It doesn't start tumbling and flopping around from irregularities of its own balance and weight. So the same thing with a sling stone. If you can get this thing spinning like this vertically, it'll fly perfectly true. And there's one old report from Hawaii that said that the really good slingers could hit a small stick four times out of five at 50 yards. There's an awful lot of good archers that can't hit a small stick four times out of five at 50 yards. So these were really deadly in the hands of a really good slinger. They were deadly. And in the battles, there'd be thousands of these things flying through the air at the beginning. And during the battle, the really expert slingers would be using the sling stones that were perfectly made like this. So the sling, I'm not going to get up and, and this is made to my height. So one end goes around your wrist, you've got something to hold on to. The other end has a knob on it, just a knot. And when you've got the sling in here, put it back behind you, 
then you can let go of one end, right? The one that's got the knot on it. You can let go, and the other one's going to stay with you. So you swing it around your head a couple of times and let go of the knot, and because it's coming out real fast from this pocket, the movement as it comes out is spinning the sling stone, and then it flies perfectly true. So the Allah, that's, that's the name, as I said, for the hard stone of Hawaii, the real hard basalt, Allah. Allah o kama'a. The ma'a is the sling, and this is the sling stone, Allah o kama'a. And we're going to talk here a little bit about adzes. So Hawaiians had adzes. They didn't have any kind of metal of any kind. And this is the really, really, really fine hard basalt. It takes a perfect polish. It's pure black when it's really good stuff. It gets a real good edge. It'll only hold the edge for about five minutes, and then you have to have a real gentle sharpening stone and sharpen this way, because if you go this way, it may chip. You have to sharpen this way just a little bit, touch it up a little bit about every five minutes. But most people today, virtually no one, would take the chance of trying to use this because it takes years and years and years of experience to know how to use a stone adze so that you don't chip it because it just takes forever to repair it if you chip it. So why does it have this little skinny handle like this? This is a real light wood from Hawaii called Hau. And the reason it has a little skinny handle, not an axe or, or hatchet handle like we're familiar with, a little skinny springy handle, is an as is used like this. Chip, 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 chip. So you get a series of little facets running down the surface that you're working on, and then you grind that with something like that, that canoe polisher. And the Hawaiian adzes were the most refined of any of the ones in Polynesia because they were four-sided. They had two sides, a top and a bottom, and they had an angular tang. See, the, the face of the adzes here, the tang takes off at a bit of an angle. And what that does is give a good place to lash onto that keeps the lashing away from where you're striking. So often there would be some banana leaf or tapa right here to fold back over this during the work so that the, the work would not abrade these lashings. But the key is that it, it had to be of just the right angle for the work that you were going to do. Some adzes had more angle like this. Some, very few would have more angle than this does. But depending on the work that you're trying to do, you need less or more angle to the handle. So the handle is just the, the stem or trunk of a tree. And here's one of the branches. So you have to pick a branch at the proper angle. So this is a smaller, thinner adze for finer work. It would have had a cover like this on it, and nobody would have been allowed to touch this except the true experts in adzing. This is a little bit different one. This is something, see the thin adze blade? This kind of blade can break easily. It can snap, actually, but at least break here. So it would not be put on a heavy handle like this. This is somebody else's handle that I got a long time ago. And so, yes, I can hold it pretty much the same way. But because when this is stiff, every time I hit, it's a solid blow right into the edge of the ads blade and very likely to chip or break it if the ads blade hits a hard knot or something in the wood. It's just too much danger in a thinner adze blade like this to use a heavy handle. And that's why the few old ones in the museums will be real skinny like this. And so here's a, a finishing edge that's real, real skinny, you know, for finishing off the surface of a, flank, a plank or something. But it, it would be great for carving, but it's real delicate. So again, a real skinny handle. Here's the blank of a real small one. Some expert has chipped that out of hard basalt, many, many real perfectly skilled chips to where it's just ready to be polished and it's already fully shaped. And the skill that it took to do that, as small as this is, is almost beyond belief. I don't expect there's anybody left in all of Polynesia that could make that today with, an, with another stone. But this one is the last one we'll talk about. Now that's a whole different ball game, right? Look how heavy it is. It's got a lot of mass. Its blade is real, real thick. It's not too wide. It came from my own property in Hawaii on the Big Island, Honoka'a area, when I was working in one of my gourd patches. And to my great 
delight I found this because that's a real rarity to find intact today. But you can see the chip marks where it originally was chipped here and there and then ground and ground and ground down. See how it's got that breakaway back here? The typical Hawaiian adze form. All right. This is a felling adze. This is for cutting down a tree, doing real heavy work. It's real thick through here. It's got a lot of weight and mass, so it'll really bite into the wood, and it's not going to break here. It's not going to chip easily here because it's got a lot more angle to the front. It's got a few chips here and over here on the side, a few little chips that are just darker color. That's the inner color of the stone. The stone will gray out over time just from oxidation, but this is from modern tools like discs and plows in the cane fields that would cause these damages. But because this one is so thick, it never broke. It's only got a chip here and two little chips here, and it never broke. So this is the kind of adze that was hafted up on a big, heavy handle, and you could really go at it like we would with one of our modern axes. But the key, again, with an adze is it strikes this way in line with the grain of the wood instead of this way straight into the grain. And so it's, you're really taking off much smaller cuts, but this is, this is a great big heavy adze head used for heavy felling work and a, a rarity to find, as I say. And this is the last thing we're going to talk about. This is a replica of a beautiful, beautiful Hawaiian stone implement that I found one time that is a strange story for another time. It was as if it was gifted to me, and it was perfectly shaped like this. It was fully polished. It had a tiny little neck at the top that flared out just a little bit and then was flat on top of that. The most exquisite stonework I'd ever seen and the most difficult I'd ever seen it was perfectly made, and it's called a pohaki aloha. A friend of mine made this replica and made this, which is very similar to what Hawaiians would have done, and it would allow a fish line to be taken down several hundred fathoms exactly where the fishermen wanted it to go because the currents couldn't grab that stone in any way. It would just drop right straight down where the fishermen wanted it to go. So it's a rare artifact, and the Bishop Museum in Honolulu has a couple of them, but not anywhere near the quality of what I was so fortunate to be gifted. So that's called the Pohaki Aloha, and that was a perfect example of the finest of the ancient Hawaiian stonework. So that is the end of the story for today, and I thank you for watching.